Hello, today is Tuesday the 18th of August 2020. My name is Hannah Forsyth and I'm interviewing Monique Celadon for the Voches Oral History Centre at the University of Texas, Austin. Um, please know, Mrs. Celadon, that this interview will be placed in the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection at, at UT Austin. If there's anything you do not wish to answer or talk about, I will honour your wishes. Also, okay. if there's something that you want to talk about, please bring it up and we'll talk about it. Um, because we are not conducting this interview in person, I need to record you consenting. So I'll ask you a series of five questions. Please say yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each one. There are two questions we need to make sure you agree to before we go on. Okay. So, Rochez wishes to archive your interview along with any other photographs or other documentation at the Benson Library at UT Austin. We will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to Rochez. Do you give Rochez consent to archive your interview and your materials at the Benson Library? Yes. Um, do you grant Voches copyright over the interview and any material you provide? Yes. Do you agree to allow us to post this interview on the internet where it will be viewed by people around the world? Yes. If any, oh no. We have many questions in the pre-interview form that we've already filled out. We use that information from the pre-interview to help, pre-interview form to help research. Um, the entire form is kept in a secure Voce server. Before we send it to the Benson, we would have stripped out any contact information for yourself or your family members, so, you, so that will not be part of your public file. Your public file will only be accessible at the Benson Library. Do you wish for us to share the rest of your interview in your public file available to researchers at the Benson? Yes. And finally, on occasion, Voches receives requests from journalists who wish to contact our interview subjects. We only deal with legitimate news outlets. Do you give consent for us to share your phone numbers and your email with journalists? Yes. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you. So we're going to start. Um, right. So yeah, to start, will you just tell me a little bit about yourself? <laughs> um, my name is Monique Celadon, and I am I live live in Manor, uh, Texas. And it's a small town just outside of Austin. I have five children, um, ranging from ages 19 to 31 years old. And um, I'm a Maynard ISD school board trustee. I'm also an I'm a advocate, community, community member, um, and an activist. I um, work with the Maynard, um, well, I'm the vice, I'm sorry, I'm the president and the co-founder of um, Manor, Texas COVID-19 Disaster Relief. And um, so that's, that's about it. I mean, we've, I've done a lot of work with the community. I sit on the, um, the city economic development committee and also with the emergency management team with the city. Wow, so you're very, very busy. Very. <laughs> Have you lived in Manor for a long time? I've lived here for about 21, maybe going on 22 years now. Okay. Wow. Uh, born and raised in Austin, Texas, though. Cool. So when did you first learn about COVID-19? Um, gosh, that's a, that's a great question. I believe it was um, a little bit on the news in late Mo uh, February. Mm -hmm. And then I really started paying attention in early March. Um, but I didn't, I didn't watch the news too much after that. I, I just, um, so I think it was really early March where it got to be really severe. And had you started with the Maine of Texas disaster relief by then or? Um, actually we did the Maine of Texas disaster relief. It was very interesting because we, um, there was a group of us ladies and I created a Facebook page and we were originally just going to um, go and drop off bags of food to the elderly and figure out a way how we can go and shop for them. And then next thing you know, there were so many donations, we needed a building. Um, and then next thing you know, the city mayor was asking me to be on his emergency uh, management team and um, join forces with the city 
and create an avenue to be able to provide for the elderly, disabled, and the uh, single women with infant children. And so that grew very quickly, and by about March 10th or March 14th, I believe that was well underway. And um, the Lions Club here in Maynard provided a building for us, and then it was just nonstop from there. It was it was an organization that grew out of the pandemic. It wasn't something that you were doing prior to the pandemic. No, no. Um, I've always, you know, worked with the community and whatever um, they need. And um, this was just another opportunity. I was probably on my sofa for about two or three days watching the news. And then all of a sudden I just got this... Um, feeling that, you know, I can't just sit here and do nothing. I've got to do something. And so that's when I started uh, creating the, uh, the organization. Mm -hmm. And can you tell me a little bit about the ins and outs of the organization and how it runs day to day? Yeah, so we're still very much, um, on, you know, uh, feeding our community. Um, we have, uh, we're not even official yet. We actually you're in the works with all of the paperwork and everything but it was great um start because there were organizations that stepped in to help us uh have an avenue and a way to provide donations and so forth and so um but the ins and outs is basically tuesday wednesday and thursday we provide meals we provide 600 meals out to our community where they come into the organization or, or drive through um, where we're at and we have a volunteers passing out the meals. Um, we get various donations such as uh, sweets like donuts and stuff like that that we add to the meals or snacks. We also are an avenue for the Central Texas Food Bank to provide food boxes to our community and so we give out about 300 food boxes every other week uh, or twice a month uh, we give out about 600. So that's an additional um, to the mills. And then ourselves, we do also hand out, we do deliveries, Sunday deliveries, um, used to be Saturday, but now we've moved to Sundays and we get volunteers to go in there and pack boxes. We pass out about a hundred boxes. Um, every, it was every week, we've moved to every other week now since the need is not as much as it was in, in, the, in the past. Um, and we have about a hundred volunteers that uh, that volunteer with us, wow. and several organizations that are supporting our organization. How did you recruit your volunteers? Um, you know, I, I think the most important thing for me is to create relationships with people. And over years, there's been uh, relationships created and trust built between myself and many community members here. So when I posted that I needed volunteers and I, we posted a volunteer sign up sheet, there was a young woman who really stepped in to help. Her name is Laura Perez. And she um, created uh, all these Google Docs because I'm not really savvy with all of that. And so we had volunteers sign up via Facebook and um, Google Drive. And so um, they did that and, and uh, they started signing up and we, we reached almost 100. But then even in addition to that, we've had several organizations come in and, and offer their volunteers and their help as well. So I believe that our volunteer uh, base is really probably close to 200 people that, that are in and out and, and volunteer from time to time. Wow, that's a lot of people. Yeah. <laughs> How did you it's manage? Been amazing. Yeah. It's been amazing. Yeah. How did you manage so many people with a pandemic going on at the same time? Like in terms yeah. of so, everyone. So unfortunate. Yeah. So unfortunately, sometimes we had to turn volunteers away. Um, I ran on a strict uh, rule that we didn't allow more than ten people in the. Lions Club at any given time in the building. Um, now we've moved to a church. Um, we moved a couple of months ago to St. Mary's uh, Episcopal uh, Church here in Maynard. Um, they graciously provided that building for us, which is amazing. But we, ha we do have rules. And sometimes um, if 30 or 40 volunteers would show up, I would take them all. You know, we'd, we'd go outside and we'd stay outside and we'd get in a big circle and I'd I sometimes have to send people home. Um, 
we had strict rules about, you know, um, hand sanitizing and wearing masks and staying six feet apart. And in the building, um, we always have stations. You know, two people work in this station, two people work in that station. And, and usually, uh, once it got running, I was just really overseeing everything. And so I had my little desk off in the corner and made sure that uh, we always kept the rules and so forth. And then I have a great vice president who, um, who has really stepped in and helped a lot. And so together we, we do great. I have a lot of people that I depend on for, for that. Amazing. It's a lot yeah. of organizing for you. Have you had practice with it in the past? Um, really, you know, with my own business, Sullivan Property Group, I um, own my own business. And also I've been very active in the community. Like I said, I used to be the booster club president for the high school. Um, so I had, uh, I, I had, I had that, that experience. But I tell people all the time, I am not the most organized person, and I definitely don't know all of the ins and outs about um, online, you know, like all of the Google Drive, and and I'm not real savvy with technologies, but um, I've gained the trust of some people that will absolutely step in and take care of that for me. So it's just been a great experience working with these volunteers and um, to see how it all came out. It's funny, I tell people all the time, um, I didn't know what I was doing. There's a lot of times I don't know what I'm doing. I just have a thought. And um, by the grace of God, it all works out. Mm. And so this has really worked out. Wow, wow. But were you able to work alongside or how did that work? You were running? Well, you know, to be honest, um, business for me really, really fell on the wayside. Mm -hmm. I focused um, solely on how we can help the elderly and the and the disabled and single mothers and and also just families in general because we never turned anybody down and we've been able to do that which is which is amazing we haven't been able to i mean we haven't had to turn anyone away there's been so many families even leaders in the community or you know people that you would never expect that have had some issues and problems and they come to me and they ask for help and I make an appointment with them or one of my trusted volunteers um, make an appointment with them and they come in and, and get what they need. But going back to that, um, it's been hard for me to, to work. And so business has been slow and, um, mm -hmm. you know, income is always an issue. So it's been tough. It's yeah. been tough. Mm -hmm. I think it's very important that we serve the community and the people um, and, and everything else will fall in place. Yeah, it's a very brave and selfless mindset. Um, do you, so your first reaction to COVID was sitting on the sofa watching the news and then you decided to set up this disaster relief. Did you have any other thoughts or feelings around the virus at the time, apart from we just need to help people? Yeah, you know, there's, all, there's always that fear and worry. Um, but, but I prayed a lot and um, my kids were very against me at some point um, going out to help. And my older daughter was always very, very worried. And she would, she would call me or text me and say, please, mom, please stop. Please go home. You know, you don't have to do this. You have diabetes. You have, you've had heart trouble in the past. You have high blood pressure. You are a prime candidate to get this disease, please, please go home. Um, so there were always those concerns and worry, but once it took off, there was no way that I could stop. Um, it just, there were so many people in need. And as I saw the need grow drastically, um, I had second thoughts a lot, but there was no way that, that I could stop. There's just Amazing. no way. <laughs> Amazing. So your children were more worried about your health than you were or unfortunately yes yes absolutely but that's yeah. okay and what about them How, what were their reactions to the arrival of the pandemic in texas so my older daughter um she and her husband and her baby quarantined immediately and they wouldn't let me see the baby they wouldn't let me see you know they there was no more going over their their house um and when when i did it was 
a drive by or, you know, me waving out to, to see my granddaughter. And um, so they took lots of precautions and that's why I think she was the most concerned about, about me. And she did a lot of research and um, watching the news and, and all of that. Um, I had my son and my, uh, and his girlfriend and their baby, infant baby living with me. And um, for the most part, besides just going to work, um, my, uh, I call her my daughter-in-law, but she's, she's uh, his girlfriend, but um, she just, you know, went to work and came back and they um, lived upstairs here at my house and they basically just stayed. Uh, my daughter that was in college, once um, the dorms closed and the schools went online, um, I just kept telling her. Um, so it all escalated while she was home for college because it was during spring break. Mm. But um, when she went back to get all of her stuff, I told her get back as soon as possible. You've got to, you've got to get back. So that was a real worry of mine, and worrying about her and also being, you know, serving the community and and she's on the road and I'm and I was really worried about her and I tried to keep that as private as possible and not worry. Uh, um, my volunteers, but I definitely had people praying all the time. And then my, my other son uh, lives in uh, Dallas. He quarantined immediately with his partner. And so I didn't see them for months. And then um, my other son lives in Buda with his wife and child, and uh, I didn't get to see them at all. So there was those times where I really missed my family, but, um, but I was also very, very busy with, with the community and serving in this organization yeah so serving with this organization that has kept your mind off missing your family but did you do anything else to kind of stay preoccupied um and kind of not worried like what did you have any other outlets to keep yourself from keep yourself yeah. calm so mostly the organization it, um i was working 60 to 70 hours probably a week on the organization, making sure that we got donations, making sure that the Facebook group was um, updated daily, doing videos, doing interviews with um, people who wanted to do podcasts with me um, or interviews, um, people who wanted to do videos, like I said. Um, but I do have one friend that we kind of leaned on each other and we talked, we still do every single day, um, sometimes two or three times a day. And so, um, we kind of, she said one time, I think we're codependent on each other during this pandemic. And I was like, wait, no, don't use that word. But, um, <laughs> but I, she goes, well, you know what I mean? Um, but it's been a blessing to be able to have somebody to, um, be right there. And, and anytime I was frustrated or if I broke down and started crying or mm -hmm. if there was stress, um, I, I knew who I could call to, to lean on okay. that would would help me get back um, focused on what the real need was. So, but, and again, I kept a lot of that from my volunteers. They probably would have never known the, mm -hmm. the stress and worry I was going through. That's very resilient of you. At some point though, you do need to kind of have that sort of outlet. And so what sort of things would you share with each other to kind of um, above where we were? Yeah. So above, I mean, um, you know, did, did you find, honestly, did you find toilet paper today? Did you go out, you know, do you have enough water? Um, Hey, you know, do you need anything? I'm going to, I'm going to order some things today. So we really uh, depended on each other for all of that. We talked about family, what their thoughts were, how they were doing, um, and, and just shared lots of information of personal information about um, our lives and what we were going through and really talked a lot about our concern and worry like what do you think is going to happen are we really going to have a lot do you think that you know um, there'll be uh, you know military involved to come and you know keep people in their homes uh, we talked a lot about politics and and um, she kept me updated on some of the news Mm. because I just kind of refused to watch the news or I just didn't have time. And when I got home, sometimes I was just really tired and I would just go to bed. Um, 
Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Why, why would you refuse to watch the news? Um, I don't know if it was so much as the fear as it was more of the negativity and um, the, some of the arguments and, and you know, um, I just feel like it's more important to be on the forefront helping than to be talking about um, who's right or who's wrong. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't want to really see all of that. And I knew that people were going to keep me updated on anything that was really important. Um, and that, and that was it. I had one person say, Oh, Monique, you need to stop watching the news. And I was like, I'm not watching the news at all. <laughs> like you have no idea. Um, so it, it was just to, I think it was just more peace, peace of mind. And I needed to be focused on, where this organization was going to go. And since I was on the emergency management team, for me, I needed to ensure that I was available for the city and the seven of us, I think there were seven of us um, had meetings and coordinated with each other. And, and so we just, you know, it, it was part of it was time. Part of it was just all the negativity um, and, and there's better things to do. Get out there and help instead of, Mm -hmm. just sitting there watching the news all the time. Yeah, totally. So uh, were there any other organizations you were part of as COVID kind of progressed? Yeah, so um, I am also a co-founder of uh, an organization called Joy to be Free. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, that is alongside the friend I was talking about, um, Patricia Perez. And so we do um, women's conferences, empowering women to um, you know, just be their best selves and whether they're stuck in a relationship or if they, um, you know, want to go back to school or whatever. So we, um, we have that organization and through the pandemic, we were doing our, we decided to do Freedom Friday videos. And so every Friday we would do a video and we're still doing them. Um, a video about what we are, some of our thoughts on the pandemic, sometimes our worries, sometimes our confusion, sometimes um, just whatever we, we were thinking about that day or that week. And so we would talk about topics and we had people chime in and, and watch our videos. So that was a, a way that we decided like, we've got to say something, we've got to do something um, because our conferences were canceled and because because of the pandemic, we couldn't finish out our series of conferences for this year. So we decided to do Freedom Fridays, and then we're working on some other um, thing projects that we're gonna bring out soon. Um, so that's one, and also I'm the uh, vice president of the Mainer ISD School Board. Mm -hmm. And also I am a, a minister with the Destination Ministries. And um, that that's, let's see, what else? In the city, um, so yeah, there's, I'm sure I'm missing some. <laughs> Lots, a lot so busy. Yeah. So can you tell me a little bit about, a bit more about contracting COVID and how this then affected all the work yeah. that you're doing? Because that must have yeah. been a huge yeah. impact on your life. Yeah, it did. It really did. Um, it, uh, so, you know, I thought I was doing everything possible and I was taking every precaution, uh, wearing my mask, uh, you know, even gloves when working with the food or whatever. We have a station when you walk into the church that has hand sanitizer and it's right by the restroom. So wash your hands, get the hand sanitizer, put gloves on, get your mask on, take your temperature. You know, we were, we were doing a lot of those things. Um, and so I really thought I was doing everything possible that I wouldn't get it. I really feel like um, somehow it entered my home though. I believe that I didn't get it uh, volunteering or with the organization. Um, again, I have a daughter and oh, well, uh, my, my uh, son's girlfriend that, that works in, in, a, in a doctor's office. And so she was um, going to work every day and my son had lost his job, so he was staying home. But, and then I had my college age daughter who was also in the house and would every now and then go out, you know, and hang out with her friends or something. And even though we were taking precaution here at home as well, I, I really believe that somehow it entered my home and that's how 
how I got it. But um, so I had had our very first um, organization Zoom meeting. Everything had started to calm down. We were really organized. We were really getting focused and we were about to, we had gotten our EIN and we were, got the name together and all of that. And we registered our name. And so we had our very first Zoom call. That was on a Thursday evening. And I was just like this. I was fine. But then I started feeling a little bit um, feverish during the meeting. And I was supposed to film the Freedom Friday video right after that Zoom. So when we ended that, my friend Patricia, she goes, hey, you know, she texted me. She's like, hey, um, aren't you going to jump back on so we can do the video? And I had spiked a fever of like 103.8 or something like that. And um, it, it just came on so suddenly. It, it, so suddenly, I, I just, I had no symptoms at all. But going back now, thinking about it really um, over the last, you know, several weeks, um, I did have some stomach ache and, and a little bit of like um, upset stomach and some loose stools and some things that, that probably were the on. But I thought maybe I drank some bad milk. Maybe I ate something that just didn't sit well with me. I mean, it's not uncommon to have a little bit of an upset stomach. Um, and then on Thursday, during, I had a headache and pretty much all day that wasn't going away. And I wasn't sure. I, I didn't think anything of that either. I took some Tylenol. But then that Thursday night. And so um, I just, I knew that I probably had it. And I gathered a bunch of things and went to my room. Mm -hmm. did, what did it feel like thinking I've actually probably got this virus? Um, I'm sorry. What, what does that, that feel like to think, okay, this is probably what I've got and I'm going to go to my room now. And yeah. And, and I knew I was going to quarantine and I, I got, I got like sprites and soups and I even um, so much as took a microwave to my room and, you know, we, I just had my daughter help me and I was like, I think uh, I'm going to, I'm going to have this. And my doctor called me that night um, and she goes, well, you need to go get tested in the morning. Mm -hmm. But um, there's a sense of fear that came over me for a little while, though. Um, and, then, and then after that, um, and we can talk a lot more about that, but uh, after, after the initial couple of days and when I found out, I, I, my doctor called me and because I tested that next day. I was well enough still, as long as I took fee uh, Tylenol, I, could, I drove to um, get tested. And so um, then the test came back and she called me that night and she said, uh, honey, you have, you, you have it. And, and she goes, and I started crying and I said, I knew I had it, but hearing it is different. Mm -hmm. And um, I started crying and she said, I've, I've, uh, I've helped 40 patients and only four have gone in the hospital and I haven't lost one and I don't plan on losing you. And um, so I said, okay. So she was very kind. She's a really good friend of mine too. She lives right across the street. And um, so she was, she was very involved in my care throughout the, the time. Um, my daughter stayed back from a trip that she was supposed to go to, my young daughter, and she took care of me. She um, dropped, she would take things to my door and, you know, and stuff like that. So. so she was back from university at this point. Yes. Yes. And what uh, kind of roughly what date was this when you got sick? Just to place it within. Oh, yeah. Uh, goodness, it was I believe June the twenty fourth or twenty sixth, somewhere around there between the twenty fourth and twenty seventh. Um, and it was right before my birthday, right? Because my birthday is June the thirtieth. Um, but you know, I. Uh, spent a couple of days um, really questioning, you know, how did I get it? Why did I get it? You know, I've been out there helping people and I'm very spiritual and, and I'm, I'm Christian. And so of course I'm having this talk with God going, you know, I've done everything you've asked me to do, you know, and, and here I am now. And so I spent a couple of days whining and, and um, being upset. And then I was like, okay, 
well, this is just another opportunity for me to, to help people because mm -hmm. if, if I make it through and everything works out, then I'll know how to help people get through it. And so after I was, um, I, well, I, I guess about midway through, um, I, we decided to do COVID family boxes. And so we've had so many families that reach out to us that say, my whole family is ill. And so we've been able to provide them with vitamins, um, D3, vitamin C, um, juice, apple juice, Gatorade, you know, all kinds of stuff that we go and drop off at these families. And then like they have little kids and they can't cook for themselves. So we offer little boxes of cereal and snacks and all kinds of stuff like that. So it's, it, something that was very negative. We, I, I uh, really knew that I was supposed to turn into something positive. That's great. Um, you said you spoke to the, your doctor and she said uh -huh. she had, out of the 40 people that she'd dealt with, four had gone to hospital. How sick did you get after that phone conversation? Yeah, so um, I got very, very sick. There was a couple of days that my doctor was trying to get a hold of me because she really wanted to admit me into the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I knew she did, and I was ignoring her calls. Um, and she, we had a conversation later, and she goes, I knew you were ignoring my calls. But she said she had talked to her superior and gave him, you know, my readings and, you know, all of that stuff, and that he really felt that I needed to be in the hospital. What really helped me and what I was really blessed with is that I had a friend of mine whose uncle had, or her boyfriend's uncle, had passed away like six months ago and he had this oxygen machine left left at in in his house or in his room whatever um and so her boyfriend brought me that oxygen machine so and then my other friend brought me an oximeter to um to uh, gosh uh, check my level of oxygen and so every time it went below the recommended which was i think 92 so every time it went below i would put my oxygen the oxygen machine on oh, and so i was very lucky to have that i really feel to this day that that was a big um part of me getting better but i was very very sick um fever chills body aches the worst pain i have ever felt in my entire life the worst sickness that i have ever had it's almost like um every sickness you've ever had all in one. Um, I often described it as like a dog thrashing a rag doll in its mouth back and forth because it, it, at times it makes you feel like you're going to get better and then you just are down again. Mm -hmm. And so there was no telling. There was sleepless, so many sleepless nights and um, no appetite at the loss of smell and taste were a big, big um, effect on, on your appetite. And so um, it was very bad. <laughs> yeah. Sounds, it sounds absolutely terrifying. What about kind of self-care remedies? You had this oxygen machine, but did you take it and you took Tylenol and you didn't want yeah. to go into hospital, but did you do anything else to kind of help through the sleepless nights or? Yeah. So my, my daughter, um, my daughter, she, she researched a lot and, um, she went in and, and, uh, found these vitamins. And so she ordered me all of these vitamins. And so she brought them to me, my older daughter and the one that never left her house <laughs> for anything masked up and came to her mama's house. And I remember her opening the door and I'm like, no, what are you doing? And she had the baby with her and, um, but they had ended up getting it all anyway because, um, and we can talk about that because my son had visited that Wednesday from Dallas and we had to get together, but, um, she gave, she got lots of these vitamins and I just immediately started taking them. And I do feel to this day that, that, that they helped. Um, there's a lot of controversy about that. What um, were vitamins? So, um, there was zinc, mm -hmm. there was D3, vitamin C, I was already taking vitamin C every single day. Um, 
but she had brought me D3, zinc, uh, it was like broccoli root, olive leaf, um, turmeric, I think, or something like that. Um, liquor, licorice, I think, some oil. So, I mean, there, there was all these different kinds. And, you know, if you document anything, I can give you a whole list of uh, them at some point. I don't have it right here. Mm -hmm. um, but I took those every day, every day. And I still do. I, 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 I didn't stop taking them. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, I, I believe in my heart that, that the combination of it all helped. Most and definitely. Then, they sound like immune boosting vitamins, all the things that you need for something like this. Yeah, yeah, definitely. But the doctor didn't prescribe me anything um, for the pain. I took Tylenol and then I do have an injured shoulder, which um, I had some hydrocodone. So I took some of that, um, you know, to get through the nights of the pain that I experienced. Can, would you mind if I ask a bit about the pain? Is it solely on your lungs and chest or was it everywhere? Everywhere, everywhere. I even, um, my hands were uh, getting calluses on them. I, I remember talking to my sister and on the phone and she, they laugh because there's some conversations that I don't even remember. And they ask me some, don't you remember you told me this? And I'm like, no, I don't. But you know, because um, my doctor said that your brain will be foggy, you know, you, you're going to have loss of memory. There's going to be things that you think don't have anything to do with COVID, and, and it is. But anyway, I even had pain in my hands because I had calluses all over them. It was weird. I, I have no idea. Uh, I had no idea that that was even a symptom, but yeah, absolutely. Um, it was, it was, it was everywhere. The pain, the body aches, it was horrible. Um, mm -hmm. Headache, even ear aches. I experienced like if I had a double ear infection. Wow. Your throat, everything. And you have your son and your daughter-in-law living with you. Were they, and your daughter who's home from college, were they your main kind of, did they take care of you or was it did you do it mostly self-care because you were afraid of them getting it? Mostly self-care. I was afraid of, nobody came in my room. My daughter, if she opened the door, she left um, at, uh, on a table that I had put right next to my door. Um, the community mem members, they, they poured their love and out by bringing so many items to my door. And so it was almost every day, two or three times a day, my daughter was bringing stuff in my, in my room. And I had a, a, a long in the room that I just put everything on top of there. Um, and so I lacked for nothing during this time, except for um, this virus is very, very lonely. So I lacked for uh, company. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, when you quarantine, and you're by yourself and you're in your room, it, it can be very, very lonely. And so um, I remember, you know, talking to the, talking on the phone with Patricia. And also I have another friend. There's a, there's an app that is called Marco Polo where it's um, video uh, messaging back and forth. And so every day I, I video message with her because I wanted to document the, um, my progress or, or lack of progress. And so the videos are very uh, detailed and they're pretty cool to watch. Yeah, what, what <laughs> I go back and watch them and I go, oh my gosh, I was that sick. Wow. Yeah. What can, yeah, so what can you notice from the videos? Like how did you develop? Yeah, so um, the first couple of days I was, um, I looked, very sick but okay and then for about I'd say seven days I was like literally telling her please share with everyone that this virus is real and I was very I mean you can tell in the videos I was I was very very sick usually I was laying in bed with a blanket and um so the videos were kind of dramatic and then slowly 
It's I'm doing better today. Look, I'm sitting up. And so slowly, slowly it got better and better and better. Because I've heard some reports of how the virus affects people is that you would start to feel better and better and then suddenly you'll get hit again by another wave of kind of pain. Did this happen to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the description that I say about uh, the rag doll in a dog's mouth because, oh my gosh, it just goes back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, there were, there were, you know, thank you for bringing that up because there were, where there were some times in the Marco Polo where, look, I'm sitting up and then the next day it's, oh my gosh, I'm really sick again. You know. It's terrifying so. for you. It must have felt, it must have felt endless. It did. I, I was always wondering when is it going to end? And, um, you know, after a while I start thinking, you know, is, are these body aches from me laying down in bed so much or, you know, is, uh, is it uh, from the illness? And so I guess it was a whole combination of, of everything. And my older son, the one you that lived with me, um, they pretty much quarantined themselves upstairs and didn't come back. Uh, it turned out that, uh, that they did have, you know, and gosh, I don't know, like, I don't have permission to share that with you, but uh, they did, ha and I'm not giving you names, so, but they, they did have it. And so they quarantined themselves upstairs, so they didn't come down. Um, not that they didn't want to help me, they just probably couldn't, and they had their baby to worry about. So, um, and we, although the baby wasn't confirmed, we know that she had to have had it. Um, and then, because she came out with a little rash, um, and then my other daughters, the one that uh, visited me, her baby got it. And the doctor told her that they don't need to test her because if she was around, she has to, you know, she has to have it. Mm. So, um, so it sounds like it's impacted most of your family or all of you. All of us. Yeah. All, all of my children got it. And then their significant others. Um, and then it went beyond that as well. And the two volunteers that were with me on Wednesday, the day before I, um, I got really sick, they ended up getting it several days later. Mm -hmm. And I knew they would. I mean, we were, there was the first day that, that and, and I know you didn't ask this question, but going back, thinking about it, the first day that we, that one of my volunteers came up to me and she goes, Monique, our birthdays are coming up. We haven't really done much. Can we just go down and have a meal together? And I was like, well, I don't know, you know, and she goes, we can go to this little place here, you know, in Manor and just sit in a corner and we can social distance. And, you know, so I finally gave in and I said, yeah, we can go do that. And all three of us got it. So I was already contagious that day and I didn't have any symptoms at all, except for that upset stomach. Um, but I didn't know. I had no clue. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, and you, you're certain or pretty sure that it came into your house rather than you picking it up just in the community or? Yeah, I'm almost, I'm almost positive. I'm almost positive. I mean, we tracked it. You know, Ma, you know, where did I go? Where I usually, you know, during this whole time, I was only really going to the volunteer, the uh, the building where we had the food, the church or the Lions Club. But at that time, it was the church. I was really only going there and home. It was always just there and home. And usually if there were things to buy for the organization, I one of the volunteers who, you know, were younger and um, more able or they didn't feel as concerned that they would get it or get it as bad. We would meet in the parking lot. I would give them the company credit card. They would go inside, buy the stuff, come back out, load my car. So there was no me going in stores and doing all of that stuff. It was you. So that's why I think I really got it from here. Hmm. Well, gosh, it's very, very frightening for you. Um, do you feel, you mentioned a sense of fear with the virus and you said you'd like to touch on that again. Um, but also I wanted to ask about how you feel maybe your mental health has suffered, if at all, after getting the illness. Because 
obviously spent a lot of time alone. Um, yeah, yeah. That's a, that's, a, that's a good question too, because, um, you know, as much as, well, I, this, is, this is to help people, you know, with this research, right? So I do feel like I suffered a, a big depression after um, I came, came out of, of that, and which is one reason why I needed to go away. There was so much strife in my family over this virus. Um, it's going to be really hard for me to talk about all of that, but um, it kind of divided us, and it was really, really, um, it, it just had a big impact on, on all of us because some of my children thought, well, you know, you'll get over it, you know, and then others were really worried, and so there was arguments, and there were distance and and just all kinds of things and we had a family trip planned that um you know there was there was some uh some that wanted to cancel it some that said no you know we've we've, we've taken off of work we've done this and then my older daughter was like no we should cancel it because mom's sick and then i was upset because i'm like give me some time maybe i'll get better because i heard that you know some people were getting better in 3 days and we had already all been around each other so i thought if we go on the trip i think it should be fine because it was just renting a house and so there was all this confusion and all this strife in my family and so um that on top of the virus on top of the loneliness Mm -hmm. uh, I fell into a, probably a very deep depression for about 10 days. Um, and, and it was, it wasn't easy. And again, I talked to Patricia every, almost every day. Um, and then all of a sudden I not her anymore. And when I went into this, um, mental, just, I, I thought a lot. I mean, during that time, I just had a lot of thoughts about, everything and so I needed time for myself and and to really get through what I was going through and talk myself through it so that I could get better wow how I hope you don't mind me asking but how do you how do you talk yourself through something like that if it that's uh, a well really strong attribute yeah I I prayed a lot and I thought, I thought about calling the doctor to get on some medication or something, but, um, but I, I, I slowly got better. Um, just, I, I took some time to be in prayer and worship and, um, read, read scripture and, uh, cried a lot, which I hadn't done a whole lot of that. Um, so you know, I don't know if it was a, a depression that needed medical attention. We were talking about how you helped yourself through your depression during like your illness. And you said yeah. you, you prayed and you worked on yourself for 10 or so days. But you came out the other end, obviously. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I just, um, anybody who reached out to me or whatever, I would just text them back and go, I just need some time. And so it was really a reflection of um, really looking at what really happened to me. It, it all happened so fast and I didn't have time to even, you know, think about being absolutely grateful that God you know, got me through that and that I just needed some time to really look at every piece of, of what had just happened in the last 30 days or 45 days, um, to me, to my family, um, you know, loss of income, loss of, uh, possible relationships with my, with some of my children. Um, you know, it was just, I needed to figure out a way to fix some of those things. And, um, and it was hard, but, but I got through it and, um, and it's going to be a daily, a, a, a continued daily work um, for, I don't know how long. Mm. Especially as it's just still very much around and it's something yeah. that's just like a continuous reminder really, isn't it? Yeah. Um, I always, Think, you know can I get it again 
and I don't know, you know, we don't know for sure. Um, but, but that's always in my mind if, you know, am I going to get it again? So just on that, you, did you, did you get tested? You did. And your doctor said you were positive. Did your doctor tell you anything after the illness had passed about antibodies or kind of what's next for you post viral, anything like that? So what she did tell me is that, um, like, like the flu, um, people still, there's professionals that still study the flu and that it's, they've been studying that for years and years and years. And there's a lot, they still don't know about it. And she goes, this is very new. We don't know everything about this virus. Um, we are learning day by day about what the after effects are and whether or not people can get it again and the antibodies. Um, so far, it, what she had told me is um, you're, you're probably safe for several weeks, but I can't even guarantee that. I don't, you know, we don't know. And so the biggest thing is they really don't know. I think they're, she said it's going to take years and years and years of studying before we have all the answers and we may never have all the answers. Wow. So um, I'm just still very uh, cautious. And um, I, you know, when we did go on vacation, we, we were very cautious and we um, chose activities that were outdoors where we can really stay distant. Um, in the hotels, we didn't use, you know, that we didn't get in elevators with other people, you know, just, just certain things that, that we uh, made sure we're really cautious about. Um, you mentioned part of the um, effects on your mental health was kind of family strife, and obviously won't go into that unless you want to talk about it. Um, but one of the things you said was a loss of income. And so obviously I know that you weren't able to work because you were so sick and you were doing the disaster relief. Um, and you mentioned your son lost his job. Can you tell me a bit about the effects of this on your family? Yeah, I mean, it's, um, there was, living by faith sometimes is really hard. And that's really what I continue to tell myself every day is that, you know, everything's going to be okay. God's going to take care of it all. And we're going we're gonna to do fine. Uh, my son ended up having to, um, well, choosing to move out um, to be closer to his daughter's, uh, I mean, his uh, girlfriend's work. And then there were some, you know, some issues due to that strife that we had in our family that, that they chose to abruptly um, move, well, to rent a place sooner than, than expected. Um, and so uh, they, uh, I, I mean, all I can say is we just, it's day by day, you know, um, I'm sure I'll get a client here and there and, and everything will work out. The market is great right now. So I know that eventually things are going to come in. Um, but you know, that I, we're, we're at a standstill right, or I'm at a standstill right now with my, with my finances because um, you know, there's bills to be paid and really no money <laughs> coming in right now. So, um, but, but, you know, we just stay faithful. I stay faithful and, and I believe that God will really come through in a big way. And how did that affect your health care that you didn't go to hospital, but what about seeking any sort of help COVID wise for when you were sick or did you not need it? So you mean what, what type of, um, like with the doctor help or what do you mean? Um, well, if financially, if it was a struggle, how did you, what about with healthcare? How did you cope with that? Oh, right. So I do have insurance, um, health insurance um, with my husband's, because uh, my husband lives in Michigan and we're currently separated. So he still has me insured. Um, the problem is, is that in Michigan, I would have to be in Michigan to get any major um, health care or whatever. But one thing, and I, and I don't want to ounce my doctor, but she said, you know, don't let that affect you, you know, coming in. And again, she's a good, good friend of mine. So some of the discussions we had were on the phone. And so she really helped me as far as like not having to 
have me either come in the office or do the online. Um, so I just saw her online once. And other than that, it was, so she really helped that way. So the medical bills were, were very low. Um, and so as far as um, getting help, I did apply for unemployment, but that, that hasn't come through. And um, I know that they are, um, they say it's in process, it's in process, it's in process, but I mean, you can't even get through. There's, you, can, you can't even get through. And I guess it's harder for entrepreneurs, but they were offering it to us. Um, you know, that's why I applied and I didn't get denied. I just got, it's in process. So um, maybe at some point that'll come through, you know, I, I don't know. How long ago did you apply? Oh my goodness. Um, early, I, th I believe it was early April. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just for um, the record and other people when they watch this, can you tell me a bit about your work as a realtor and then how obviously that may have slowed down due to COVID? Yeah, so um, my work as a realtor has always been, I, I'm not um, one of those realtors who want to go out and make millions of dollars. I do real estate so that I can make a living. And so if I sell one house a month or one house, a, a larger um, commission every other month, then that, that uh, gives me the opportunity to spend time with family, gives me the opportunity to help my daughter with college and um, spend time with my grandkids and help the community and serve on the board, the Mainer ISD school board, um, and do my ministry. So as long as I'm able to make a living, um, for me, real estate has, I've been in real estate for 27 years. I did the, um, the part of, you know, trying to go out there and make tons of money. Um, but as long as, like I said, I, I make a living and I'm able to do that. Um, so because I don't have a huge pipeline, because I don't have a huge team, because I didn't have all of those things in place, um, when this pandemic happened, my passion went towards uh, helping people. And so I kind of, um, I, I just kind of stopped working and, um, and it just happened that way. So uh, I did have a couple of closings during the pandemic and that kept me through, um, you know, for a little bit. And, uh, and I have another one coming up in, in October that'll really help, um, if that goes through. Um, so I, you know, I, d I just didn't have all of that pipeline and backing for something like this. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I had a little bit of savings, but not tons of it. And so it's been a struggle. And as soon as my, um, my son lost his job, uh, you know, he was giving me a little extra here and there and that kind of, that kind of fell back. Um, very understandable. He has a daughter. And so my main concern and worry was being able to keep a roof over our head and, um, you know, food and our lights and gas and stuff on. And I did take the opportunity or the advantage of, um, you know, being able to pay a little bit at a time and the electricity and the water and stuff. So that helped a lot. Um, and then my landlord has been amazing um, it, with, with this house. So um, this, this month I told her that I was going to have to, you know, pay her in small payments here and there. And so she's abs absolutely been amazing. Told me not to worry about a thing. So. Amazing. And now, um, well, at the moment, kind of in out in recovery and um, slowly going back to work. What are your main concerns? Um, to move forward. So, so uh, definitely, you know, getting a couple of clients here and there and, and trying to get things back to some sort of normalcy. But um, during all of this also, I have a campaign to run because I'm up for reelection and uh, I have an opponent. So, um, turned in my application on Friday and uh, announced um, via Facebook uh, yesterday. And so I've got the campaign going and I've got to get back to work. And, and then I still have the organization that we have to continue um, to move forward. 
So those, and then getting my daughter back to college. We take her this Friday um, to San Antonio to move into her apartment. Are uh, her um, courses going to be online or are they going to be in person? So most of her courses are online. However, she does have biology courses that she will have to do in person. And um, so that's why she's getting uh, her her apartment, which is a shared apartment. Of course, it's it's a, a housing, a school housing. So, and can you tell me a bit about um, the re-election and your campaign that you're up yeah. for? <laughs> so, um, we run four-year terms. So back in 2016, I ran and I won. And so um, this year with this presidential election, I'll be on the ballot for place six Maynard ISD school board again. Um, like I said before, I've, I'm, I'm the vice president. And so I, I think we have a lot more to do. We've really improved over the last four years. I've been a big part of that. And I think that um, there's a lot more to do to help these children. One of the things that I want the most is for uh, Maynard to have a resource center slash community center for our, um, for, for things like this that happened, um, that they'll always have a place to go to and that the children and families in Maynard ISD and our community will not go without. And I've been one of those families. I raised five children in this community. And um, at 28 years old, my husband got cancer. And I had four children to worry about during that time. And I, I looked for resources here, and there were literally none. So um, it's very important to me to help the families that some that are in my, you know, that were in my position to to get through those kind of things. So I'm excited about that ne next step of me trying to work with the city to try to get a community center for Maynard. And what, along with the community center, what other resources would you hope to offer for the children and for the community? Um, you know, um, just continue to work towards uh, the programs that are needed here in Maynard ISD to, um, be able to be a part of um, whatever new buildings we're going to need or we just had a bond election that passed last year and so we have a lot of things on those bond the bonds that we need to get busy with um, but the pandemic truly put a stop to all of that um, mm -hmm. because we literally you know we in our school district every time somebody gets COVID you know we have they have to go quarantine and then that whole department does and then um, school you know keeps getting pushed back and I was a proponent for it being pushed back um, towards the middle of October and I mean middle I believe we're in September uh, we're going to be pushed back to September but I really don't foresee it opening anytime soon um, so but other resources I would say I want to continue the conferences that we do to empower women here in in Maynard um, and and um, in the surrounding areas. Um, I've had conferences here at uh, the church that we do the food out of and so um, I, I'm looking forward to getting back to a lot of that stuff. Yeah and have you been back to it since being since being ill or is this will this be kind of the first? Um, no, and I think, you know, that could possibly be a part of my uh, depression as well, <laughs> that I wasn't able to really get back to doing what I have a passion for. Um, so, so I think the combination, mm -hmm. but my vice president, my, one of my very best friends, Patricia, um, she wouldn't let me do anything really until the doctor released me and the doctor did not release me, would not release me until August the 15th. She said I needed rest. And so I just got released. I was, I'm probably going to announce that today on our, in our Facebook group um, that I'm back. So I worked a lot behind the scenes, but I was not able to go to the church and help and do all of that stuff. Um, all that to say, which is why I said I'm getting out of here um, because it's just too, it's too hard for, for me to deal with all of this. Because um, usually I was able to at least turn my focus to something else if things were not going good and then all of a sudden I couldn't do that anymore so 
anyway. Yeah. Wow, wow. So you were, were you bedridden for 45 days or were you just off-bound? No. no, so I was bedridden probably for, oh gosh, I'd, I'd probably have to go look at those videos, but probably for about 14 days, 14 to 15. And because I, I'm a diabetic, because I have some underlining health issues, the doctor was like, I don't want you out there. I know if I, if I let you go, you're going to be back out there volunteering, be back out there in the, you know, at the church doing all of these, um, you know, things. Um, she goes, so, y you know, let's work together and figure out a good date. And so we, we decided on August 15th, she goes, I know you're going to be better. I know you're not contagious anymore. Um, but because of your underlining health issues, I'd rather you take at least two to three weeks to rest. And so that was, um, why it was so long. Mm. Well, I mean, it's good that you kept safe that way, but I imagine it was probably quite difficult to stay away from everything. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And so you must have been like in the midst of the worst part of the virus when everything erupted with Black Lives Matter in June. Or, yeah. So did you have any involvement in that or were you mostly sick? For so Black Lives Matter, when did that actually... Um, beginning was of it June. June. Beginning of June? Maybe later. Yeah. So I, I got it um, about June the 24th, I think. So I know that, okay, so now I'm remembering. Sorry, I had to kind of remember. So I remember when it first happened, it was early June, like you said, and I have an organization that helps me called the 100 Black Men. And they, uh, they, they donated $2,000 to our organization and they uh, vowed to help us with anything that we needed. And I remember going to the president, we were working a distribution center when it kind of first happened. Um, and, and so I said, we've got to do something. We've got to do a march. We've got to do a Zoom maybe. We've, we've got to do something. And he goes, okay, Monique, let me talk to some people and we'll figure this out. And so we talked, we talked about it, but then all the protesters started going out there and, and doing, you know, their thing. So um, we kind of laid back and we said, well, we'll do something more organized and, and uh, get together some of the leaders and stuff in Austin and the, the surrounding areas. And then I, um, I know that um, my daughter, again, didn't want me to go out there did want to go to some of the protests. Um, and she, my little daughter even said, I know you're aching to go out there, mom, but you know, we don't want you to get sick because I wasn't sick yet. And so, um, but she went and my younger daughter and she went a couple of nights until it started getting pretty violent. So then I believe that she stopped going, but she, she went a few nights and she goes, mom, don't worry about it. I got you covered. I'm going, <laughs> you know? So, um, she had a, a, a shirt made and signs and, and all of that. Um, and, but I was constantly talking with leaders in the area and in the community to keep updated as to what, you know, we could possibly do. And um, so I made a statement on Facebook and um, people shared that. And so it was, it, you know, I, I got involved also by um, making a proclamation with the Maynard ISD school board um, in the Maynard district, we had a proclamation um, for uh, Black Lives Matter. And so I was the one who suggested that we do that. And, and we got that done. And so that's great. That's amazing. How does it feel to go from being kind of the on the ground organizer to having to be, do your activism online? because of COVID and because of being sick, does it feel yeah. strange for you? Very much so, very much so. It was very different because um, I, I, I'm a very patient person, but when it comes to technology, I'm not as patient. So, and, and somebody always does it for me. And so um, just be, having to try to figure everything out 
rather than just getting up and going, you know, like, can we just, I'll just meet you for coffee or I'll do this or whatever. So um, it was, it was a big change. It was a big, big, big change, big difference. Mm. Um, and it was very hard to, to do. But um, like I said, in the beginning, when I wasn't sick, I had people helping me. And then when I got sick, everything just kind of, you know, you're on your own. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, I mean, we managed and I managed and, and, and it worked out. It works out. And can, can you tell me a bit about the proclamation that the Mena ISD did for Black Lives Matter? Yeah, sure. Um, it, it just basically um, said that Mainer ISD is a proponent pretty much for Black Lives Matter and that we will um, honor the movement, basically, and that we support the movement as a whole and that we will ensure that everything that we do at Mainer ISD will be um, always, you know, thinking of the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, it's a it's a whole long proclamation that the attorney, um, you know, uh, created, and then I looked over it, and then we all voted on it, and it was a unanimous vote. And do you, how much say or conversation have you had around the um, opening schools again and going back to schools in the fall? Yeah, lots of conversations, lots and lots of conversations. Um, with the superintendent, with our administrators. We've had meetings um, also with other school board members. Um, so, and parents, community members. And it's very, very difficult to be in a position like this because you basically have so many parents who want to go back to school, who need their children back in school, who um, have to go to work to provide for their family. I can't imagine me having my five children, raising them, and all of a sudden school stops. And what am I going to do with five children when I have to go to work? And so it was a very, very difficult decision for me to side with um, extending uh, the closure of school. But I've been through this pan uh, th through the sickness. And I was very, very concerned about our teachers that are elderly or that are older, not, not even elderly and I got really, really sick. So I was very concerned about our teachers um, and, and and our staff and our students. And maybe if one of the students was um, exposed at any time, then they would go home to a parent or grandparent and and then they would be sick. And, and then I couldn't imagine our schools closing all the time. And although the administration came up with really great plans to get back to school, we as a whole decided to, to um, move it, to continue to close until further notice. And could you use your experience as something to advocate to keep them closed? And have, yes. you, have you talked about it? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and that's one thing that I just couldn't, um, I just couldn't, I couldn't be a proponent for opening schools right now because of what I went through. And I said that over and over to our administration and uh, other school board members and in meetings um, because I saw what I went through, what our family went through and how it spread so quickly. Um, on Wednesday, my son drove down from college. I mean, I'm sorry, not college, from uh, Frisco because he lives in, in the Dallas area. And um, we, had, we had a small brunch and he had been quarantined, everybody had been quarantined, and then we break it for one time, and I had no symptoms at all. Um, and everybody that was there got it. Everybody that came to my house that day, and it was for a matter of two hours. We weren't even hugging or drinking after each other or you know, anything. It was kind of social distance. You know, I have a big table, we sat apart. So I just, I don't even know, like, it's just, it's so contagious. It's, I feel like there's a part of the illness, like, a, like there's a time that maybe I was so contagious for two or three days. I mean, that's what I feel mm -hmm. because everybody I got came in contact with. So do you, do you think that you passed it on to everyone else rather than you caught it from someone else in your family? So I think I caught it from somebody in my family um, 
And then the rest of my family that came in to visit with me uh, got it from me. Wow. I, I believe that that's how that happened. Yeah. And it spread just ridiculously. And then it just spread ridiculously. Yeah. Because my son in law, he never came into the house, but he got it because my daughter was here. Um, my son's partner got it. And then my other son, he got it and he was never in my house. Um, the one in Buda, but mm -hmm. his wife came that day. Wow. It just kind of spread. And are they all okay or how? Yeah, everybody. Um, my older daughter, she goes, mom, no, you know, no one would have ever known I had it because all I had, it was loss of um, smell and taste. And uh, I just felt bad. But, hit, but her husband got really sick. I'm not as sick as I did, but, but very sick. And, uh, you know, my son's girlfriend got pretty sick. Um, but, but they all recovered very well. I took longer to recover, I think, because of my underlying condition and because of my age. My daughter from college was never confirmed that she had it or not. But, um, but she did, you know, have headache and all, a lot of the symptoms. Um, but she was able to, you know, move around and, and stuff like that. It's not like she was in bed. And how do you feel now moving forward in terms of what Texas is doing to kind of avoid the spread of the virus? Are you, have you changed your behavior and can you see other people changing their behaviors now they're seeing it's serious? Yeah, I wish I could see more behavior change <laughs> um, because um, I feel like I'm not seeing what what I would like to see, and I worry for the for the world really. For I worry about um, the effects that this could have on on people, um, and I'm seeing more and more. Uh, things on Facebook from close friends where people are saying that, you know, I have a cousin who passed away or I have an uncle who passed away and it's, you know, usually from COVID. And so I'm seeing so many more posts of people dying, um, which is one reason I'll go back and people ask me all the time, Monique, why didn't you go to the hospital? And I said, well, people were dying in the hospital. And I just figured that if I went there, I was going to end up, you know, getting sicker maybe. And then I would die alone. And I didn't want to, I didn't want that. And um, so, but I knew that if the time came, I would, you know, and, and I couldn't breathe um, and it got really bad. I, I would have gone. Um, but uh, I wish people would, would, would do better. Yeah. And what about yourself? You've just been on holiday. Did you find yourself being more careful or kind of more fearful having come out of the, having the virus and then going out into the world? Yeah, my daughter and I were extremely careful. Um, we talked about it a lot. Mom, do you think we can get it again? I don't know. You know, um, do you think we should be out here? Probably not, but, <laughs> but, you know, it was also my mental health that needed some healing. And so, um, again, our, our vacation wasn't planned. I went down to Michigan to um, hope to get a, a doctor um, for my shoulder because I need shoulder surgery. And um, so that didn't work out. And we had already had tickets um, paid for. So we, you know, we just kind of visited. With, she wanted to see her dad. And so we visited with him. And then we decided, she goes, mom, can we, you know, just go here and, we got in the car and just drove and we went through like six or seven states and we were in the car a lot, but we did go to Niagara Falls and some other places. So, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, we took every precaution in the world except for, I mean, we were worried. We were concerned. We were like, okay, could we get it again? Um, How did or if somebody started coughing or something, we'd go, Let's move over here, you know, it's like, it's so, anyway. And how did that feel be, from going from 45 days inside to being on the road and going through different states? Like, 
what great that- yeah it felt great um free gave me a lot of time to think um i'm a thinker and i've got to figure out like what's my next step in life and um what what's what's on the agenda next and so if i don't have time to think and there's a lot of noise which um or just a lot of stuff going on then i then i just get lost and um and so i needed to refocus and figure out, um, okay, this illness is over, um, and let's get together and figure out what what's next. Let's get and your you mind have, and figure out what's next. And do you have any idea what that might be? Well, number one, definitely running for you know reelection, mm-hmm. and then um, ensuring you know that my family was uh back together and and that happened at a, at, and that happened just last this past weekend um so there was restoration in our family which was amazing and great so um that that was my number one concern coming back is you know i'm i'm a mother of five and there i never thought in a million years that my kids would be you know not talking to each other or not talking to me there, you know, we had, we were the family that had Sunday dinners every, every week, you know, not during the pandemic, but you know, before that we were, you know, we had Christmases, Thanksgivings, you know, we were always very close. And so when all of this pandemic happened and everything happened in my family, um, I knew that that was going to be my number one focus to get my family. And so um, I didn't really have to work hard for that. They figured it out and, and they did it. And I was just very grateful that it didn't last six months, a year or two years, because we don't have time in life to have, um, a, you know, hard feelings or anything with people. It's very important that we stay together and, um, you know, life isn't going to wait on us. We've got to make sure that we're in a place where we're at peace with each other. So anyway, that, um, but besides that, I need to get back to work. <laughs> so, um, but, so I have some thoughts in my head about, you know, getting my next clients and, and so forth and, and growing my business. Um, but I do always tell people that real estate is definitely not my number one. I feel like um, my passion is, is helping people. And so that's what I've lived by and that's what I will continue to do. I want to really focus a lot on our Joy to Be Free organization and, and get that going and share this story and share other, other women and, and what they've gone through and try to help one another to get through this year together. Have you had a lot of women come forward and share similar stories during this time? Yes. Um, it, it, maybe not a lot, but there are women out there who, um, you know, usually the, the woman normally like the matriarch of their family and they're the ones who kind of hold everything together and, um, feed their families and stuff like that. And I'm not saying that men don't, they usually, you know, it, it's just, I hear more from women. And so, uh, there's, there's been women that have reached out to me that, that are in need and, um, and so, and, and have the, the virus and, and they have a family to, to take care of. And so, although um, our stories are a little bit different, they knew that they could come to me and, and get the help that they needed. And it, it was amazing because um, I was doing this while I was sometimes ill in bed and I would just text Patricia and say, I just got a message from this person. Can you make sure that they get taken care of? Or I just got to make, you know, I just got a message from this person. Can you make sure they get, you know, some stuff for their family? And so she was out at getting volunteers to deliver to these families while they were reaching out to me. Well, and have you, you mentioned family boxes and from your own experience that has kind of changed the way you were doing the disaster relief. What other things have you kind of, um, change due to how you experienced the virus? Um, definitely I've been ordering a lot more online. Um, you know, um, 
I was really hesitant to do stuff like that because I just don't like technology. <laughs> and so, um, but other than the COVID boxes, I mean, we've just been as, you know, taking more precautions. Now we ensure that everybody that walks in the church, their temperature is taken. Um, but I do want to say this, you know, you can do everything in the world to try to keep safe from this virus. And I'm not an expert. I'm not, I can only tell you through my experience. Um, and, and, and we still got it. My son quarantined for months. He still got it by coming and visiting me for two hours. I encourage people to wear their masks and um, to keep your distance. But I believe in the end that uh, if you're going to get it, you're just, you're going to get it. Like, I mean, I'm not saying not to take the precautions, but um, I go back and think I didn't have a fever on Wednesday and I was highly contagious. So even though we're taking temperatures at all these places and before you go in and we're taking temperatures here at the church before you come in, that doesn't mean that that person doesn't have it. So be even more precautious, um, even above a temperature taking because it's real and, and it's highly, highly contagious. And that, and my sisters ask like, what can we do to stay safe? And sometimes I think, I don't know if there's anything you can really do to stay completely safe. It's everywhere. So just do your best. And then I think the best thing to do is that when I think the most important thing to do, and this is what I've been telling people, is be prepared. Have the items that you need in your home. Go and get those things. Um, whether like Gatorades, apple juice, Sprite, soups, teas, hot teas helped me. I sipped on hot teas all the time. Um, get all of those things prepared. So yes, take all of the precautions but have those things ready. And the vitamins, vitamin C and vitamin D3 and zinc, I think um, are the most important ones that I took. Um, and just be ready. Take vitamin C now, get your immune system built. Wow. And I feel like we've covered a lot. <laughs> um, is there anything else you'd like to share with me about your experiences um, that I haven't asked? Um, no, I, I think, I think we did cover it and, um, are we going to interview? I didn't, I don't know if we were or not. I <laughs> think if I thought of anything, I could send you a message or something. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, um, if, if there, if there's anything else you'd like to cover, obviously we can talk about it now or we can go on to yeah. talk about it again. I, I think the most important thing for, for families and for people out there is to, um, to be compassionate with one another. I know that uh, there, were so, there was a, a family member of mine who really, really hurt my feelings. Um, he had messaged me some text messages and it wasn't my immediate family, um, but he said, I don't know why you're not telling everybody. You need to tell everybody you have this virus. I can't believe that you may have just spread it, you know? And so it was a really, um, a really hurtful message because me as, as a leader in our community, I did everything that was recommended, you know? And so um, I think it's very important to have compassionate with people, compassion, be compassionate um, and, and help one another. That's the biggest thing is that during this pandemic, for so many people to be fighting about wearing masks, not wearing masks, doing this, doing that, um, you're, you believe this way or you're Democrat or Republican. I think those things are not as important as being out there and seeing the needs that people are going through and being available to help them. Um, and I thank everybody who was, was there to help me and my family who brought meals, who um, brought things to the door. And I, I think just in the, in the world and what we're going through right now, we need to be available for each other and have compassion mm -hmm. and love before we uh, uh, criticize and, and demean and, you know, all of that stuff. 
in a time like this more than ever, we need to stick together. I agree, it's brilliant advice. And I hope people listen because we really need that. We really yeah, need that. we do. We do. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. Do you, I just, again, want to check, do you have any last words on anything? Um, Disaster relief from Mena, like what's going to happen next? So you, anything you want to share? Yeah, so I think, you know, overall, one thing that's come out of this disaster relief is that um, we've really been doing this as a community, especially myself and a, and a handful of people. When the hurricanes came in, when, you know, there were people that were um, relocated and they traveled down 290 towards Maynard. Um, we've always been out there trying to help people in these types of situations, whether there was a tornado or whatever. So we did change our... Uh, Maynard, Texas, COVID-19 disaster relief to Maynard, Texas disaster relief. Because I, I intend for this organization to continue past the pandemic and to be helpful in, uh, in areas where there's any emergency whatsoever. And that includes a loss of a family member or an accident on the highway that's coming through Maynard and that we can reach out and help um, those families. And so I'm glad that, you know, some people think all negative about this pandemic, but if you try to look at the positive parts or what we can learn from it and how we can move forward and how we can do better as people, as a community, as a country, really, then I believe that um, that's the most important thing. Let's figure out what we can take positive from this pandemic, from our experiences and turn into good. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I think